we have uh, looked at John chapter 6 uh, up to verse 46. So now we will continue John chapter 6, verse 47 onwards. <clears throat> if we could have uh, one person, please read out. Uh, verses 49 up to verse 57, probably. It's a rather large chunk, right? So maybe we could just uh, read out uh, verses 49, 50, 51. Yeah, if we, if someone could read out 49, 50, and 51, please. I'll read. <coughs> yes. My sisters ate manna in the desert, but they died. 51. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, we live forever. The bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I'll give so that the world may live. Then 59, eh? And then, uh, yeah, if you could also read 56 and 57, please. <clears throat> 56. 56. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in him. The living Father sent me, and because of him, I live also. In the same way, whoever eats, whoever eats me will live because of me. Please yes. Then, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Them. Yeah. Now, um, when we read these verses, uh, it sounds rather shocking to us. Um, but the listeners, when they were listening to him, they would have understood what he is saying much better because this was terminology that was familiar to them okay because uh, when you talk about um, eating and drinking uh, they understood what that would mean uh, in their you know cultural context that that was a term that was used to absorb something into your very innermost being you eat it you drink it you literally make it a part of what you are, of who you are so uh, they obviously knew that he's not in any way talking about anything cannibalistic. He's not talking about anyone eating uh, flesh literally or drinking blood literally. They, it was a metaphor that was familiar to them. They understood that he is saying that uh, you must uh, you know, absorb me into your very innermost being. You must be willing to accept me into, your, uh, into the core of who you are. Um, so um, now... Uh, you know, those of us who live in a in more modern times, we are not that familiar with this metaphor. So when we, uh, uh, you know, hear someone saying, "Eat my flesh, drink my blood," we would probably think of it uh, along cannibalistic terms, uh, and it would not make any sense to us. But for them, in their culture, that was a metaphor that they were familiar with. They clearly understood what Jesus is saying. He is saying. Be open to me uh, to the extent where you're willing to accept me into your innermost being. Um, so uh, because of this uh, kind of wrong understanding that we have of these things, of these terms uh, in our more modern times, it kind of led to a lot of wrong practices. Uh, there are people who believe that uh, unless they you know, have communion before they die, uh, they would not be able to get into heaven. So they make it a point to see to it that the person receives a wafer and some wine or grape juice just before they die. Uh, because if they eat his flesh and drink his blood, only then will they be able to you know, gain eternal life. Uh, and even for um, uh, little children, um, they give them uh, the, the bread and the, and the wine, uh, thinking that only if that little child has that, only then uh, you know will eternal life be birthed inside them. So it's not really talking about you eating anything material uh, or you drinking anything material which will result in eternal life. Uh, rather, they, these are symbols that we use uh, to demonstrate something that has taken place at a deeper level. We have finished making a commitment to him. We have finished inviting him into the innermost part of our being where he has now been made Lord and we have submitted to his Lordship. And now we are just eating the, um, the bread and uh, drinking the grape juice 
in remembrance of this you know commitment that now we have made with him and he has made this covenant with us so we remember what he has you know um uh, decided to offer us through his covenant and we remember how we have submitted to him in entering into this covenant so we are just acting out something that has already been done inside our hearts so the just the physical eating of something and the physical drinking of something really cannot lead to any kind of eternal life so it's very very sad that uh, you know when when somebody is uh, dying in the last stages of life and someone goes to them with a piece of wafer and some wine and they think that just by doing that they are absorbing jesus into them how can that be because it the actual meaning of what jesus was saying is that you know open yourself up to me right to the core where you're willing to believe in me and uh, invite me into the into your innermost being so that that person never did throughout their lifetime that person who is you no know, lying on their deathbed now never opened themselves up to the lord never believed him to that extent um, never surrendered to to him to that extent and now just by eating something material and drinking something uh, liquid uh, they assume that they can absorb jesus into them that is not very uh, realistic so here it is not talking uh, about uh, by uh, about the physical process of eating and drinking something to gain eternal life rather it is talking about how you should be willing to take jesus into your uh, innermost core because that is where what really matters to you resides right there in there you know your deepest ambitions uh, your uh, you know deepest longings the things that you really want to do with your life all of those things are there at your innermost core and you need to trust him and allow him to enter that space and allow him to become lord over that um, uh, because then you know then he is lord over all of your life and then you can say i have truly made a commitment to him i have eaten him i have uh, drunk from him and now i am his because um, that's the uh, wording that he uses jesus in verse 56 he says whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood in this sense of you know are uh, inviting me into their innermost being whoever does that they remain in me and i in them and because they are remaining in me and i am living in them it says in the next verse you know they will live because of me not just living in the sense of physically being able to breathe and having your heart continue to breathe uh, to beat but also living in the sense of uh, living at a higher level where you are born again where you are your where a new life has been released into you and you're now living by the power of the holy spirit um you're now preparing yourself for the next life which god has awaiting uh, for us so um all of these realities are being presented to us in a metaphorical sense and the these people who are listening to him the jews they grumble and listen to the way they grumble because it it throws light on um, how they have understood this teaching uh, if someone could read out verses 60 um maybe we could just have 60 61 62 if someone could read out please i'll read yes many of his followers had this many of his followers had this and said this teaching is too hard who can listen to it 61 without being told jesus knew that they were grumbling about this so he said to them does this make you want to give up 62 suppose then that you should see the son of man go back to the place where i came before right. yes uh, so here we have uh, these disciples who have you know been disciples who have been followers of jesus up to this point now they are saying this is a hard teaching and they are not saying this is a hard teaching because jesus is saying eat my flesh and drink my blood that is not what is troubling them uh, we get to know what is really troubling them because earlier on we read that already um, so if someone could just you know re read once again verses 41 and 42 because that will kind of throw light on what they are grumbling about verses 41 and 42 please the jews then complained about him because he said i am the bread which came down from heaven and they said 
is now this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know how it then that he says, I have come down from heaven. So they are not finding what Jesus said hard to understand. They have understood it very clearly. He's not talking about any physical eating of flesh or any physical drinking of blood. They have clearly understood what he is saying. He is saying that they are supposed to uh, surrender to him from their innermost being. And that they are finding very, very difficult to accept. They are calling it a hard teaching and saying, who can accept it? You are asking us to surrender to a carpenter's son. We know your father and mother. We know the town that you are from. And now you are saying that we should submit to you to that level, to the extent where we place you before bread. You know, so they are finding that hard to accept. Not that they have not understood what is being said, but rather what they have clearly understood. They are uh, finding it difficult to uh, practice it. And so finding that they are unable to practice something so difficult, many of them walk away at this point um, and you know they stop following him uh, so they do not stop following him because what he said sounded very strange to them and could not be understood by them but rather they walk away from him because they have clearly understood what he has said and the demand that he is making of them is too great and so they say this is a hard teaching and they choose uh, not to uh, follow him um, so Jesus, uh, you know, he says to them, this is how he replies to them in verse, uh, if we could uh, have someone read out verse 63, please. It is the spirit who gives life. Uh, the, the whole of verse 63? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Yes, uh, we'll get into that verse, but then uh, we have uh, uh, Brother Shay putting up his hand. So, uh, uh, yeah, anything that you would like to say? Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you, Pastor. Um, it's just an observation to make a comment. You know, what you just told us now, uh, many people have preached on those verses wrongly, as you pointed out, you know. Many people think, oh, what Jesus was saying was very hard. And like he pointed out, they feel it's literally saying that we have to eat the flesh of Christ through the communion, you know. And it gets me worried now, you know, hearing this, it shows, it looks like we're far away from the culture of then. And then there is tendency for us to interpret scriptures in light of how we see the world now. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I think we may need to know more about the Jewish culture so that you know we can understand things in context. Because this is really this verses that you just explained to us really can throw a lot of people out of balance. Because for so many years they have believed in a lie, not knowing that this is actually what Jesus Christ was saying in the context of the Jewish culture at that then. So I think going forward, you know, it's important that we look really, really at scripture and look at the context historically and culturally so that we do not just take it out of context and think that, oh, this is what the Bible is saying. Thank you so much for pointing that out. Thank you. Much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you know, and uh, it comes across so clearly because when the when the Jews begin to grumble, they are not grumbling about cannibalism at all. They're not grumbling about that. They're grumbling about them having to submit to the son of Joseph. They find that very, very hard. So, uh, yeah, when we look at the overall context and we also have a greater awareness of the writings of that time where these kind of words and phrases would have been used, we gain a clearer picture of what was actually being said and how the audience of that time understood it. Uh, so coming to verse 63, uh, where Jesus says, uh, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. Uh, so over here, uh, you know, Jesus is uh, pointing out that the flesh counts for nothing. The um, physical things, the material things that we tend to focus so much on, those things count for nothing 
in the long term they will keep us alive and they will keep us comfortable for maybe a hundred years but beyond that uh, it is the spiritual things which will take us to the next level uh, so he says the flesh counts for nothing it is the spirit who gives life and these words that i'm speaking to you all these words that i'm speaking to you on a daily basis they are full of the spirit and life they can take you beyond this minimum 100 years and take you right into eternity for all the things that god has planned for you so it's uh, such an amazing thought that when a little uh, you know baby is first conceived god is not just planning out a uh, uh, you know 90 years or 100 years for that little child but eternity all of eternity is being planned out for that tiny little baby uh you know when that when that little child is conceived so which is why you know when um, people go ahead with abortion and all of that uh they're not just terminating um uh, you know a little uh, a cell or something they're actually terminating a life because at that point of conception god has already planned all of eternity for that particular child uh, so here god says the words that i would jesus says the words that i'm speaking to you they are full of the spirit and uh, life uh, so he is talking about um, how uh, the flesh can only take you so far but the spiritual things that he is speaking can take you uh, far longer right into eternity and there's another thing that maybe we could um, just learn from this particular verse um this is not the context in which Jesus is speaking. You know, what I have explained just now is the correct context. But just to, you know, uh, another uh, thought that we could maybe walk away with from this particular verse. Uh, if you look over here, Jesus is saying, the flesh counts for nothing. It's like very irrelevant, very insignificant. So are you a person who is like looking at yourself and thinking, you know, in the flesh i am so limited i am so unable uh, to do so many things there are others who are so capable you know their flesh uh, the way they have been created the way god has made them uh, they have god has put so much inside them and they are able to accomplish so much on the other hand i am so um, untalented uh, so uh, frail and uh, i have nothing and you know God's words can be this to you. Uh, so, and, and I'm making it very, very clear. This is not the direct context, okay? So, uh, but this is a learning that we can draw, an extra learning that we can draw from these words. Um, the flesh, you know, your flesh, your weak flesh with all its limitations, Paul's weak flesh, which had a thorn in it, which was really not re up to the job, up to the task, uh, that flesh counts for nothing. What really counts is Jesus' words, which are full of the spirit and full of life. So Paul, in all of his weakness, with that thorn, which was always constantly you know, uh, pulling him down, he chose to live according to those words of life. And that is why his life was full of the spirit, and he was full of power, and he could accomplish so much. So. Um, this, uh, this verse you know was, has been very encouraging for me in my life uh, because um, except for this one talent that I have of teaching I'm not very good at many other things and so I always thought my the Lord has called me into full-time ministry and I really am not up to the you know mark on uh, so many things and uh, this verse has been such a blessing to me because uh, in spite of all the weaknesses of my flesh my flesh counts for nothing what really counts is the spirit of God who gives life and uh, the words that Jesus has given to us in the word are full of life and full of the spirit. If I can hold on to them and absorb them into my being and uh, live based on them rather than looking to the weaknesses of my flesh, I can go far beyond my the limitations of my flesh because my flesh counts for nothing. His word counts for everything. Uh, and in his words, there is power. And he can help me to be things that I can never be on my own. So that was just one encouraging you know, uh, learning that I got from this verse. But then to repeat once again, uh, this is not the actual direct context. The direct context, of course, is clearly what Jesus was saying to the people at that time. 
where he explained that if you just continue thinking about the things of the flesh, that will only take you so far. But the spirit gives life, eternal life. So if you believe in the words which I am speaking to you, you know, you will be carried into eternity because the spirit will carry you into eternity based on your faith, which you have placed in my words. That would be the immediate context of the passage. Uh, moving on, um, we could um, maybe um, look at, yeah, there was just one thing that I wanted to very, uh, you know, seriously touch upon. And uh, yeah, we have a person who has raised their hand up. Albuquerque, brother, if you could please uh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, yes, Pastor. I just wanted to check uh, with the cast when you talk about the flesh. Um, are you referring to um, the body and the, and the soul component that we that we have uh, versus the spirit? Uh, does it encompass uh, you know the, the body and the and and the soul? Just want to confirm that. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, now over here in this particular verse where Jesus is uh, talking about um, limited things and eternal things. Uh, so over here, when here this word flesh is being used, it I think most probably would be referring to um, the human body and its limitations. So you give it bread and you give it more bread. But at the end of it, one day your physical body will die. But it's the spirit who gives life to your uh, to your human spirit. So you will continue to live through eternity because you know he will give you eternal life. So over here in this specific verse where this word flesh is being used, I'm very sure Jesus is specifically talking about just the human body um, and its limitations. Uh, but of course, when where where you have this uh, word being used in different contexts uh, by Paul and in all of the other gospels and all of that, so we would always whenever we look at the word, we would immediately have to think in what context it is being used. Uh, so in some places, it would probably be referring just to the physical body and its limitations. In some places, it would be talking about the fallenness of humans and uh, their desire for carnal things rather than the things of God. Um, and uh, in other places, it would just probably be referring to uh, weakness. Uh, so always, whenever we come across this word, we would have to look at the context in which the word is being uh, used, uh, because all these um, um, spiritual, uh, you know, different connotations are brought out uh, in different passages using this one word. So yes, we would have to be a little careful in how we are interpreting it. Um, in different passages. Right here, it is talking only about the physical body and its limitations in the immediate context because Jesus is, is making a contrast between eternal things and temporary things. Yeah. Yeah, the, the thing that I wanted to touch upon, um, do we have time? Okay, uh, yeah, we will make time uh, for because uh, this is something that uh, has troubled me a lot. Uh, you know, verse 44 and verse 65. Uh, if we could just have someone read out these two verses for us, verse 44 and verse 65. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. 65. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Okay, so uh, uh, this these verses have been wrongly used uh, by people to say that uh, only some people have been reserved by God, elected by God for salvation, and the, all the others, you know, right from the time they were conceived, God had already, you know, uh, reserved them for damnation, for judgment, and they have no hope. And only with this, this is a special lot that God decided are going to be reserved by him for salvation. You know, this whole uh, idea of limited atonement and unlimited atonement. I uh, will not get into the theology, we will not get into the doctrine. But the way these two verses have been used is uh, very troubling. So all I would just like to say at this particular point of time is, you know, First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. If someone could please read out these verses and you know if we all could really follow what these verses are very, very clearly saying and declaring. Okay, so uh, if someone could just read out for us 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. First Timothy chapter 2, 1 to 6. And Paul writes to Timothy, 
I exhort you, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet life and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And verse 5, which is the last verse. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. And verse 6. Oh, verse 6, my apologies. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Amen. Yes, thank you. So it's made it made so clear over here. Why are you supposed to be, you know, making petitions and prayers and intercessions? Uh, why? Because uh, for all people, including kings, including those in authority, because it is God's will, God's desire that all people should be saved, and uh, that is the reason why Jesus gave Himself as a ransom for all people. Uh, so over here. Uh, it's not saying in, in you know in in John chapter six verses forty four and sixty five. It is not saying that the Father has just reserved some people. It makes no sense, right? It says in First uh, Timothy chapter two verse six that Jesus gave Himself as a ransom, not for some select people. He gave Himself as a ransom for all people. So where's the point in saying that after having given Himself as a ransom for all people on the cross? Uh, he decides that uh, some of the people for whom I have given given myself as a ransom, no, they will not be ransomed. It's uh, so. Uh, of course, we cannot really get into that whole doctrine, so we will not go there. But you know, if someone bring, brings up these two scriptures, at least you should be able to very clearly, you know, counteract what they are saying by talking about First Timothy chapter two verses one to six. Uh, yeah, we are really running short of time, so let's just very quickly get into John chapter seven. Uh, where we have Jesus uh, going to the feast. Uh, we will very briefly touch upon the response of the brothers and how they, you know, uh, the things that they say to Jesus. And then uh, after that, we will get into the words which Jesus speaks at the temple. Uh, so coming to the brothers and what they have to say, uh, maybe if we could uh, read out verses. Um, Three and four, three, four, five. If someone could read out John chapter seven, three, four, five. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go in unto the Judea that your disciples also may see the work that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do this, things show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Okay, so uh, here uh, we have the Feast of Tabernacles coming up. And uh, usually most people would go to the temple, you know, to celebrate this. And uh, so Jesus' brothers are mocking him and uh, they say, uh, you know, why are you hiding out here in this little place? Uh, so if you are really big, if you're really great, go and, uh, you know, Declare that to the big people, to the great people, and see whether they will accept what you are saying or not. Because here in a little town, it's very easy to act big and sound big. But where go to the big league, you know, where you have all the big people, will they accept you when you say these things to them? So in that sense, they are uh, mocking him because they feel very sure that uh, you know he would be rejected over there, and uh, then he would understand. I mean, according to them, they think that Jesus then would then realize that he's not really big after all. So uh, they are rather being very disbelieving and they are mocking him. And uh, Jesus says to them, um, my time is not yet here. Uh, so he says, I will not go until I get the uh, direct permission from the father to go. So he does not go along with his brothers. Uh, he waits for the Lord to grant him permission to go to the temple. And after his brothers have left, sometime after that, uh, it says in, um, no, where is it? I think it is in, um, it says he stayed in Galilee, right? Um, 
I can't uh, seem to find the verse. You know, the 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 brothers. Uh, he, so he says, "I will not. My time is not yet." And then he continues to stay in Galilee. And then uh, he probably must have heard from the Lord telling him that now he can leave. So uh, it says in verse ten that he later goes to the feast. Okay, so uh, he does things according to the Lord's timing, and um, then halfway through the festival, that is when he receives permission from the father to start openly teaching uh, what he is uh, meant to say. And this is how he begins his teaching. Uh, if we could maybe read out verses 14, 15, and 16. Yeah, someone could read out. I'll read. <clears throat> yes. The festival, the festival was nearly half over when Jesus went to the temple and began teaching. The Jewish authorities were greatly surprised and said, How does this man know so much when he, were, when he has never had any training? Jesus answered, What I teach is not my own teaching, but it comes from God who sent me. Okay, so uh, they are surprised at the depth of his teaching. And they say, how could this man have done that? Because you know he has not studied under Gamaliel or he's not studied again under some other very reputed uh, you know, uh, Pharisee, Pharisee, Pharisee leader. Uh, so he, he, they were kind of wondering from where did he get this much learning and this much uh, you know, knowledge. And then uh, Jesus says, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. So everything that Jesus is saying, it's actually uh, rooted in the Old Testament. Uh, because uh, everything that he says, he's able to take Old Testament scriptures and uh, use them to back up what he is saying. So that is why there was great authority in all that Jesus spoke, because um, he used the Old Testament, uh, which the people were familiar with, to uh, to back up everything that he was saying. Uh, they would have understood those scriptures maybe in a very minimal light, but now he's expanding their knowledge regarding those verses and saying, see, these verses didn't just simply mean this, but they also had these other connotations. This is what these verses actually were saying in their fullness. So. What the, in the Old Testament, they, the people only had a partial revelation of those verses. And now Jesus was taking those verses, same Old Testament verses, and now he was granting them a fuller revelation regarding those uh, verses. Uh, so uh, he, that is why Jesus says in verses 19, if we could maybe read out 19, 20, 21. And read. Moses gave you the law, didn't he? But not me of you, but no one of you obeys the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You have a demon in you. The crowd answered, who is trying to kill you? Jesus answered, I performed one miracle and you are all surprised. Moses ordered okay. you... Yeah, yeah, no, no, that should be uh, enough. So we will just reflect on that first. Um, yeah, so, so Jesus says, has not Moses given you the law, yet not one of you keeps the law? Because if they were to really look into the law, you know, the first five books of Moses, uh, they would see evidence over there regarding the Messiah. So Jesus is saying, um, you are not keeping the law. You are not following what has been said in the law about me. Moreover, there's the law. Uh, in the law, there is a commandment saying not to kill. And here you are making preparations to kill me. So there's a huge crowd gathered over there that has come for the feast. And now Jesus is standing up in public and talking to all of them. And uh, many of the crowd uh, would not be aware of what's happening, you know, inside. Um, this, this uh, clash that is going on between the Jewish leaders and Jesus, they would be unaware of those details. And now very pointedly, Jesus brings that out, out into the open. He says, because I did a miracle on the Sabbath, ever since then, you're holding this you know, um, uh, grudge against me and you're conspiring to kill me. And uh, so now these people act all innocent and they say, no, 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 whoever thought of killing you? I mean, why are you saying that? Uh, so uh, even though they are trying to cover up 
their schemes. Uh, Jesus uh, brings that out. He exposes it and he says, uh, because of a miracle that I did on the Sabbath, you people are now conspiring against me. Um, and um, yeah, if we can also read out verses 25, 26 and 27. Yeah, please go ahead. Verses 25. Some of the people, some of the people of Jerusalem said, Is in this the man the authorities are trying to kill? Look, he is talking in public, and they are saying nothing against him. Can it be that they really know that he is the Messiah? But when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. And we all know. Yeah. Where yeah, that should be uh, yeah, up to verse 27. Yeah, thank you. All right, so over here, um, the people are uh, now beginning to you know uh, discuss among themselves, and uh, so uh, some people say, uh, you know, um, the leaders are not really taking any action. Uh, they are grumbling and they're complaining, but they're not taking any action against him. So maybe he is the Messiah. And then someone says, uh, but we know where this man is from. We know who, who his parents are. Uh, you know, we know which village he is from. But when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Okay. It shows their half-baked knowledge. They don't really know enough about the Messiah. They don't really know their Old Testament. Because what does the Old Testament tell? It tells very clearly exactly from where the Messiah will come. Okay, so this is a wrong statement. It, it is people who are making this, having discussions with just half knowledge in their heads. Um, why? Why can we so clearly say that? Because when Herod wants to find out where this Messiah, this king, you know, this future king, where is he going to come from? He goes to the chief priests. And the chief priests are able to tell him exactly from where the Messiah will come. Um, that would be in our uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 3 to 6, uh, where from Micah chapter 5, verses 2 and 4, where it's very clearly revealed where the Messiah will come from. Okay, so here in this in this current uh, Bible passage, where, where these people make this grand statement saying no one will know where the messiah is from that's a very clearly wrong statement and they were not aware of the of their old testament um moving on from there uh yeah jesus is saying um you do not know him but i know him because i'm from him and he sent me so jesus is establishing the fact that he is from god and then we come to the main uh, you know the core of chapter 7 uh, where with a loud voice Jesus begins to declare something and these wordings are very important so if we can have someone read out 37 up to 39 those three verses please on the last day that great day of the feast Jesus stood and cried out saying if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink he who believes in me as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. At this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, so uh, here we have uh, uh, Jesus declaring and saying, anyone who is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he's saying this on the last and greatest day of the feast. Uh, this last day of the feast, uh, I mean, commentaries say uh, this would have been um, the uh, the crowd would have gathered in what's called the court of women. Okay, so uh, that entire place would be lit up with uh, a lot of lamps. So it would be a very beautiful sight uh, where you have a lot of lights, you know, all lit up. Um, and um, also uh, on that day, uh, water would be poured out on the altar. Okay. In fact, every day the water would be poured out on the altar throughout the feast. But on this day, there would be a special ceremony when all the lights have been lit up and uh, the you know water is again poured out onto the altar. It was supposed to be symbolic. It was supposed to be a reminder of how in the wilderness, God used to provide them with water miraculously. And now Jesus is using this occasion to 
convey something new and he is saying not only did god provide you physical water uh, you know in the in, in the in the wilderness but now he has sent someone who can give you more than just physical water and you know this is again a very clear connection with the uh, samaritan woman passage uh, where uh, where jesus is talking about spiritual water and so again over here is you know bringing out a spiritual concept and he says uh, not only was physical water provided to you in the past but now he had, the lord has sent someone who can give you you know spiritual waters and it talks about the rivers of living water that will flow out of anyone who is willing to believe in him and um, uh, so here we see that it talks about uh, rivers of living water and like we saw earlier in the previous class um, living water literally meant water which is like flowing which is alive which is moving so living waters refers to fountains coming out from the uh, underground and uh, so we see that um, not only does the person who believes in him not only do they receive the spirit but the spirit also flows out of them so it's not just an inward flow that goes on flowing inward but what flows inward also flows out so it's not a one way thing uh, and you know we might you know we would have heard many sermons regarding this if the lord goes on uh feeding you again and again and again with his word and uh you know uh, with with his teachings and uh gives you inspiration and uh keeps building you up and you don't do anything about it and all of it just you know gets contained in you and sits inside you uh they say that it kind of leads to stagnation on the other hand if whatever you're receiving you're absorbing and you're practicing it and flow as well so um a person who is a believer uh, has been um, has been sealed with the holy spirit and now the holy spirit is like living waters not stagnant water so the holy spirit continues to pour into us and we are supposed to absorb that act upon it believe in it and constantly we are supposed to give it out to others uh, so that there is also an outflow and um, uh, so in fact in sermons every day you know they talk about the qumran community which used to live at that time uh, the qumran people were very concerned about maintaining their their holiness and not mingling with the world so they would uh, you know lock themselves up in the wilderness and uh, they would just talk to each other and communicate with each other they would not associate with anyone else especially not with people who are considered sinful and uh, you know uh, or whose reputations are not very good they would never mingle with anyone they would just talk among themselves and stay out there in the wilderness where they will not come in touch with anything bad or evil so this only inflow you know they they, they want to receive from god they want to study the scriptures they want to grow in god but there's no outflow of any kind what they are receiving they are not passing it on to others uh, the the living water is not flowing out to others um, so uh, the, what general preachers say is that um, because you have holy spirit inside you and because he is living waters not only should should you be actively receiving and believing and accepting uh, but you should also be giving it out to other people uh, what you are becoming should be so powerful that it can't just stay inside it literally goes out and affects other people uh, they see your life they see your words they see your actions and they are impressed and they too want what you have so uh, living waters is like that um, it cannot just be contained in it cannot be stamp you know uh, you know uh, pressed down it comes out uh so they say that that should be a kind of walk which people should have if they have the holy spirit living in them um yeah okay we are almost out of time uh if we can uh, maybe look at verses 50 51 52 if someone could read out yeah just a moment uh, you know someone has asked for um the scripture reference of mica that was mica chapter 4 if i remember mica chapter 5 mica chapter 5 verses 2 and 4 and that gets repeated in matthew chapter 2 
verses 3 to 6. Yes, if we could have someone read out verses uh, 50, 51, 52 of chapter 7. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows that he, what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. Okay, so um, uh, we have the people, uh, uh, these Jewish leaders, condemning Jesus, not accepting, uh, uh, you know, what he is saying, even though he's declaring that he is from God. And if people believe in him, living waters would flow out of them. They would gain eternal life, even though he is saying all of these things. They are uh, kind of passing judgment upon him and saying that nothing, uh, you know, no, no, nothing of what he says is really true. And then Nicodemus steps in, and in verse fifty, uh, you know, he says, "Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing?" Uh, so then they they say, "How can it? How can you even be considering this person?" Because he is from Galilee, and uh, so just like Nathaniel had earlier said. No, uh, how can anything really good come out of Nazareth? Um, in the same way, now these people are saying, uh, how can any prophet ever come out of Galilee? Because it has never happened. If they say, you will find, uh, look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Uh, now, uh, Nazareth was in located in Lower Galilee. Okay, so that's the geographical information. Uh, so Nazareth is considered very, very low. And in fact, the entire region of Galilee is considered very low. And uh, these people who are supposed to be learned are saying, why don't you look into it? You will find that no prophet has ever come out of Galilee. And they're completely wrong. Uh, because if, if they were to look into the Old Testament, uh, you know they would see that Jonah, in fact, comes from uh, lower Galilee. OK, so. Um, we would find that piece of information. I think I have, I don't want to touch upon this. I think what I have in my notes over here is wrong. Let me clarify and then talk about this. Um, Because here I have uh, the statement which says that it talks about Jonah coming from Galilee. But I would like to confirm that first. Second, um, second Kings 14.25. I know, but then uh, why would Second Kings be talking about Jonah? So let's oh, not he was a, get he into was that a, at the moment. He, he was a prophet, man. <laughs> Was a we could look into it later. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just in case there's a error, let's not say something that's I know not confirmed because I have not looked into it. Uh, so I don't want to get into that. Yes. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, anyone wants to? Um, yeah. Okay. So here we have someone saying that Jonah is from uh, Bethlehem. Um, why is Jonah getting discussed in Second Kings? Oh, I mean, whoever edited and compiled Second Kings under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, did they refer to Prophet Jonah specifically? Were they talking about a different Jonah? I don't know. I would actually have not looked into it, so I do not want to say anything before looking into it. Uh, but yeah, the chapter six and seven, which we have covered, um, anyone wants to ask anything? Or you know, you just want to share your views upon these two chapters. We have a little time. Otherwise, we'll you know conclude with a word of prayer. Anyone at all? All right, let's let's uh, conclude with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for all the things that we could learn from your word today, and we pray, O oh Lord, that as and when we need it. You would bring these things back to our minds, to our memory, O oh Lord, so that we can uh, apply these things to our situations. We pray, O oh Lord, that uh, 
uh, we would be people who are willing to open up our innermost hearts where our deepest longings reside and we would be willing to um, allow you to be king over even of even all of those things because lord we truly want to believe in you we truly want to surrender to you because we want this eternal life we want to enjoy all that you have in store for us for our future so we pray that you would help us a lot even as we walk with you and we pray that these living waters which are uh, uh, you're releasing into us on a daily basis we pray oh lord that it would flow out that lord we would be so much in you we would remain in you to such an extent that we begin to look like you talk like you and um, uh, those waters cannot be contained inside any longer but would just flow out and influence all the people that we come in touch with that we come in contact with oh lord make us that kind of people because really the reason that all of us have signed up for this course and we are attending these classes is because our heart is not just on um, physical material temporary things we really have a longing for eternal things we really want our lives to count even over the next 10000 years so oh lord we pray that uh, you would help us to uh, to practice these things that we have learned in our everyday lives thank you lord in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you so much for all of you for uh, listening patiently and also participating thank you amen thank you pastor thank you pastor thank you